Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Uh, today, I'm very excited. We have a format I've never tried, and we have a guest I've never had on the show. So the basic idea is it's going to be challenges to fossil future, and our guest will be Peter Thiel. Just a, a bit of context on how this emerged. So as most of you know, this book, Fossil Future, came out uh, May of last year. So it's been out about a year. It's been really amazing to see all the positive feedback it's gotten. It's gotten some negative feedback, but most of the negative feedback has the character of, at least I consider it to be, straw man fallacy. So instead of engaging my full argument, uh, caricaturing it, saying things like, oh, Alex Epstein believes that we should burn fossil fuels for 300 more years and we shouldn't use anything else. I don't find that too interesting. I am going to do a video on those things. I did one response to Tyler Cowen already because he did that kind of straw man thing. But what I find more interesting is the criticism from people who are in deep agreement with me or significant agreement, but take issue. I think there are many things that I say that there can be interesting disagreements with. And a couple of conversations I've had with Peter Thiel over the last couple of years, he's raised some interesting disagreements and he has generously offered to share them uh, on the show. Peter, welcome, welcome to Power Hour. Awesome, thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure. So let's start off with, this is going to be about, about challenges. Of course, even within the challenges, I think we'll have quite a bit of agreement. Uh, but why don't we start off with, I mean, you have generously endorsed fossil future, uh, moral case for fossil fuels, so you're anything but a detractor of mine. Why don't you start off with, what, what do you think we have in common and are aligned on? If you think about uh, what to do on a policy level on an incremental basis, if we have, if we over the next five, 10 years dial the world towards fewer fossil fuels. We agree that will probably be a far more, um, you know, a lower growth, um, poorer, more regulated, more authoritarian, less free world. And, uh, and if you uh, dial it to, um, to higher fossil fuel production and consumption, we will have, you know, we'll have a better world on a you know, horizon of the next decade. And so sort of, uh, sort of in our analysis of what happens at the margins, as you do somewhat more, somewhat less, I think we're we're in very violent agreement. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, a lot of the specific arguments about uh, about um, you know how environmentalism has been you know hijacked in this you know very uh, I don't know anti-science, anti-future, anti-human way. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm incredibly sympathetic to you, and then um, and then you know I think the the uh, Probably, probably the you know, you know there's sort of a lot of subtle disagreements, but if I had to summarize them, it, 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 I, I, I don't think that it is somehow the panacea for all of our problems, and that uh, uh, there are sort of ways that uh, we, we can't we cannot uh, just rely on fossil fuels to get get to the future, and that's not exactly what you say, but yeah, but that's, but, that's uh, but but uh, there is there is some sense in which. Uh, we need to do things that are very different. If I had to maybe concretize this with some intuitive numbers, um, you know, the U.S. has 330 million, 340 million people. The world's about 8 billion. It's something like, you know, something like 25 times the U.S. population. And, you know, I'm not sure what the exact number is. U.S. consumes maybe 15, 16 million barrels a day of oil. Uh, so 25 times that would be 400 million. The mm -hmm. world consumes 100 million barrels of oil a day. Um, and so if, if we said that it was, there should be, you know, um, some ideal future where the world gets to, the rest of the world gets to the U.S. standards of living. Our living standards go up, but let's say the rest of the world, you know, um, deserves to, should, in a health, converge to U.S. living standards. And I don't think, I don't think 400 million barrels a day is achievable. I don't think there's enough oil. I, I think, uh, I think uh, if, if, if you actually try to produce that much, you know, the money would flow to all the wrong people in the Middle East, the other places. There are all sorts of crazy things that so, would so happen. Do, but do you take so me as, do, do you take me as, because you mentioned that I sort of said this, but then, so, so like, do you take that as my argument that we should be using 400 million or am I not, am I not disavowing that enough? I, I take, I take your argument and mine to be in agreement that if we go from 100 million barrels a day and we have a choice, do we go to 110 or do we go to 90? Um, surely the world where we go to 110 is better than the world where we go to 90. So well, most, most people are saying we should go way below 90. Way below that, but let's, I'm, Very, just, I'm just doing the, the got marginal. It, the mar right, so at the, the marginal argument. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and of course, yeah, people say we should go down fast, but in practice, they're, 
we're going to go down slowly or up, up slowly. Um, but then I, th I think that uh, um, I think that even going to 110, 120 is 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 not going to be is not going to be enough. And that's why, uh, in my my way of thinking about the energy future, much more of the weight does have to be put on alternatives. Uh, I, I probably put put would always put the stress on nuclear power, maybe fusion power. Um, uh, uh, those were what I th think were supposed to be the energy sources mm -hmm. in the 21st century. And uh, that's what's, what's really gone wrong. Um, you know, if we, if we don't get nuclear fusion, um, yeah, we're not gonna make up for it with solar or windmills, and we're gonna have to you know, increase oil and natural gas and, and that sort of production for the next yeah. decades. But, uh, but I don't think it will be enough to ever get India, uh, you know, the emerging market countries to get to a U.S. standard of living. Let me make a general point about this, and then and then with hydrocarbons in, in particular. So the general thing I'm trying to get, and I think we're in agreement with this, but it's important is that resources are created and they're potentially limitless. Like I really do think of the world as a ball of matter and energy. The more knowledge we get about how to manipulate it, how to transform it, the more we can we can harness. And this tends to open up very big new frontiers. And so in general, the argument isn't, well, we're going to get to 400 million dollars, 400 million barrels a day of oil, but maybe it's we, but it's that there's some form of energy that we can harness if we're free and that the way to get to nuclear is to be using more fossil fuels and to have more freedom. So I think I have a general optimism about that. When I say fossil future, it's not, but let me say one thing about fossil fuel resources. It's not an exclusively fossil future. It's in the context of, I'm arguing in two contexts. One is people are saying we should rapidly eliminate it. And I'm trying to say, no, this is very wrong and we need to expand it. So, you know, the subtitle is why global human flourishing requires mm -hmm. more. It's not four times more. And I explicitly talk about needing more energy and having alternatives, but it's alternatives are usually seen as means of replacing fossil fuels. Sure. Whereas I think of them as means for the foreseeable future of um, expanding. I, I agree with that. Although I think, you know, I, uh, I think one always, um, I'm always hesitant to be quite as abstract as you are here. So I think you have- Well, I wanted to make it concrete. So, um, but the, the concrete where, where I would be skeptical is I don't think, um, I'm not sure there is a limitless amount of oil. I'm not sure um, there's a limitless amount of relatively cheap oil. And so, um, so if you were to double the oil production, I think that would, that would cost a lot more and uh, I, I think I think you do you do have some kind of resource limits to growth, well, but or, then, or, or very strange things happen. If you, you take the pre-oil history, where um, you know nineteenth century was powered by coal, and there was some limit to a coal economy, by uh, Britain in 1910-1911, you know there were fifteen million people in the workforce, one million were working in the coal mines, and it got and somehow the marginal cost of reduction went up, and it it finally hit a trigger point where the coal workers all went on strike, the Labour Party got created, and the whole uh, the whole political economy of the UK shifted radically to the left. And uh, and so if you had a if you had an overly cornucopian view of coal, which was the free market view in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, you didn't see that labor strike coming, and you didn't see the way in which the UK would become a socialist country. So um, so yes, I I, I think. Um, Energy in the abstract. There's, there, there are alternate sources we can develop. Um, there's no, no reason. We, there's no reason that there are any hard limits on, on oil specifically. I'm not so sure it's different from coal. So yeah. So I, I, I want. I mentioned I was going to say the abstract point, and then concretely about hydrocarbons, because I, I agree it's not enough to be abstract. But I think sometimes people looking at the concrete picture don't think broadly enough because they don't have a sufficient appreciation for resource creation. So let's take oil. But I think the way to think of oil is as a liquid hydrocarbon. That's really what we mean. That's really what we need, right? We need this very stable liquid fuel that performs these amazing functions that nothing else does. But I think if you think about it from that perspective, you have to be open to, particularly if we had had a much freer world, the ability to cost effectively convert coal into liquid hydrocarbon. And indeed, there are companies today, I don't know if they can do it, but they claim to be able to cost effectively divide coal into a very clean solid, into its gaseous elements, into its liquid elements. They claim to be able to do it cheaply. I don't know if these particular companies can, but I'll bet somebody could if we had more of a focus on hydrocarbon. And coal, whatever happened in England, is effectively unlimited today. I mean, that is, coal is super easy to get. It has many advantages over oil in terms of discovery 
and production. Oil, you got to find these, I love oil, but coal is just, it's there, it's easily accessible. So if we have the technology to really p refine coal, I think that's a huge potential breakthrough. And then with natural gas, you know, if methane hydrates under the ocean, we can potentially liquefy those. So I think that we need to be more open to resource creation, both within the realm of hydrocarbons, not, not limiting ourselves to, oh, it has to be liquid when it comes out of the ground. It just needs to be liquid when we use it. And then if you go even more broadly, well, with other things like nuclear, you could synthesize hydrocarbons in different ways. And then I think people tend to have a frozen view of nuclear. They just think, oh, it's just the light water reactors. It's just this one thing. I think where we're in common is we both want the policies where these things can proliferate. But I, I do tend, even people in the oil industry, they tend to narrowly think, oh, you can't go to $400 million a barrel a day, but maybe you could go to $400 million of liquid hydrocarbon using all of these different options. Yeah, my, um, again, we'd have, to, we'd have to drill down on those numbers a lot where um, there, there, is, there are probably forms of pollution you get from coal, not just the carbon dioxide emission, but um, you know, well, with these, these processes, you, you, you actually eliminate those at the beginning because you're refining it. If, yeah, it's always a question, you know, it, there was um, you know, a very coal intensive economy, a la China, is polluted. You know, it's a horrifically polluted country and it's not the CO2. By, it's by, all, our, by our standards, yeah. Um, not compared to what we used to live in. But. And, and I, I, th I think, um, and so I do think, I, I do think there's probably, um, yeah, my, my intuition is that there are some resource constraints, and if you if you don't get to the resource constraints, you you get to some kind of pollution constraint, which is why um, why um, I, I I don't think um, the hydrocarbon piece by itself will work. Even though th those are the those are the variables we'd we'd have to drill down on. I think at the margin, you know, at the at the margin, it would be good to do somewhat more. I think. The realistic debate is between somewhat more and somewhat less. It's not between you know 400 million and zero. It's you know 110 versus 90. And in terms of the realistic place where 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 that might go, you know we're we're very much in agreement. Um, but wait, but isn't me, maybe, it just just one thing about yeah. isn't it a policy? So I think we're in agreement in particular on policy because what I'm people tend because people I think are so fascistic mm -hmm. in proposals in this kind of book. There's the idea of, oh, Epstein is prescribing use this much mm -hmm. fossil fuel, whereas I'm really defending morally the freedom to use more fossil fuel and saying that'll bring us to a better world. So I don't know, and nobody can know what the fate of all these different forms of hydrocarbon extraction, transformation, et cetera, whether you run into these different kinds of limits. All I want is the freedom for people to explore that and to be able to explore nuclear and nuclear fission and fusion and deep geothermal. And my optimism is that that freedom will lead to, in the near term, an expansion of hydrocarbons. But more broadly, it'll lead to more energy for more people. I don't see any limit in terms of a cornucopian world if we have freedom. And I think we'd be way mm -hmm. far ahead on nuclear had we not had the anti-nuclear movement of the last 50 years. Yeah, there are, um, look, I, in all these places, I'm, 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 I'm libertarian in, in that I want less regulation. I, th I think these industries are too heavily regulated. I. I'm not so sure about the politics of it. You know, it's it's it, it seems to me the nuclear regulation is completely crazy. I think there were all these ways it um, it was caught up in the um, in the dual use of uh, nuclear reactors for building nuclear weapons, and people were scared of a nuclear war, and they should have been, and somehow the fear got misplaced from you know thermonuclear, the blast to the radiation to the fallout to the the quaternary thing was just the nuclear power plants. And that was the thing somehow people fixated on. Um, and uh, that's roughly what I believe happened in you know the 1970s and 1980s when the nuclear industry really got derailed. Uh, I, I think it could have gone differently. I'm, I'm not so sure it could have gone that, that, radically, that radically different. Let me focus on one other area where I think we, um, you know, we probably uh, disagree in practice, where I, I think, you know, there's a there's a way in which you have a somewhat Manichaean view. There, you know, the the good pro flourishing pro freedom people, and yeah, the, this is what the, I want to talk about next. So people, perfect. and that's and but um, particularly, I think you're saying with the like I'm characterizing the oil industry, the fossil fuel industry in an overly positive way, and then it's it's my, besieged by these villains. That's that's and then in in particular on on, on the oil and uh, 
yeah, oil and gas industry, let's focus on the oil industry. I, I think it's actually, my, the, my theory would be that in many ways, it's, it's already been hijacked by the ESG people. And in some sense, um, it's been heavily co-opted into it. And the, um, the, the sort of microeconomic intuition that I have on it, and it's, it's always very hard to know what you do about this as a libertarian, is if you have highly inelastic goods, where if you increase the supply by 1% and the price goes down 10% or 20%, um, there are um, extremely large incentives for uh, manipulating um, the market in various ways. And, uh, and that um, you know, the reason OPEC is a thing is because um, if they can, if OPEC, the oil exporting countries, if they can, if they can curtail supply by 1% like Saudi Arabia did, um, this last weekend, cutting a million barrels off the market from 100 million barrels. The hope is that that will, you know, move prices a lot more, and it will increase. It'll actually increase the revenues, some increase the profits a lot, and um, and there's sort of a strange way where I think that if we look at the um, the oil majors in the Western world, BP, Chevron, Exxon, Shell, Total, um, that. Um, you know, if, if they if they try to do what OPEC did, if they all got together in a room and said we're gonna you know we're gonna uh, cut the production to increase the pricing because of this inelasticity, that would be a Section Two violation of the Sherman Act, and uh, they'd be you know in trouble for all these antitrust reasons. And what I think has happened de facto over the last uh, decade is that um, the way they've figured out a workaround to the Section Two of the Sherman Act is to uh, coordinate with ESG people. So if every large oil company um, um, works with the same outside ESG consultants, let's say, pick on BlackRock or somebody like that, <laughs> and, um, and uh, it says, you know, will we, will we be ESG compliant if we reinvest 50% of our profits in solar and wind and 50, only 50% 50 on oil and gas? It's a um, de facto way to cartelize and uh, turn the industry into a kind of racket. And I think, I think it's, a disturbing degree to which this has already happened, um, and uh, and the, the the whole thing at this point is is corrupted in a way that's not that easy to fix. So, so you, but at first you said they were co-opted by ESG, but are you, are they? Is it not? Are you arguing they're not just co-opted, but they're sort of? Do they see it as an opportunity? It's always always all these sort of conspiracy theories, the sort I just articulated. Um, uh, uh, I always want to avoid the question of what the full mens rea is. So I okay. um, I, I think they don't. Let's say the, the, the version in which, um, I, I don't think that it's a full-on conspiracy. I don't need to go that far. All I need to say is that um, what they've learned is if they take 30% of their um, R&D money and put it into solar and wind, which doesn't work, um, the share price goes up. It doesn't go down. It's good for their share price to do ESG. Um, I mean, it was it's, for it's, a little while. I don't know, because you see a lot of you see a lot of backtracking on that but, by BP and Shell. But Shell. that would be the thing gotcha. to, to drill down on. And then that's where, that's where um, if, if the truth, if the ground truth of the industry is that it has um, somehow been hijacked, then, um, then it's very, very hard to, um, uh, to work. They're, they're, not, they're not these um, wildcatters that just want to produce as much oil as possible. I think that's still true of the frackers in Texas. I still think you know, the smaller players are... are much more the purely good guys, but they need to get access to pipelines. There are all sorts of ways that uh, that they can be controlled as well. I mean, maybe the best argument for what you're saying is you see some of these large producers will explicitly say, hey, we believe in the energy transition, but because we are the most efficient producer, we emit the least methane or whatever, our share, our share of the market should go up. So it's like Exxon, Chevron, mm -hmm. Shell. Yeah, we should be producing more oil but the pie should dramatically shrink. Like that's that, I mean, that has a flavor of what you're saying. Uh, yes, it would, be, it, would be, it would be best for them if the other people dialed back even more than they did. If, if everybody dials back in a coordinate way, coordinated way, that's also possibly a really a good outcome because of these weird inelasticities. I mean, something, something like this happened with the tobacco industry yeah, where, you bring where after, you know, after the giant tobacco settlement in the late 1990s, um, before that, the government was anti-tobacco. So if you were anti-government, maybe you were pro-tobacco because, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend or something like this. 
But um, you know, after the settlement, the whole industry has been cartelized in a crazy way. Where I think the numbers in the U.S. it's 25 cents to produce a pack of cigarettes. They sell it for four dollars because there only are the three tobacco companies that were party to the settlement that get to sell tobacco, and the government uh, adds another two and a half bucks in taxes. And so it's a it's a cartel that somehow works for the government tax collectors plus um, plus the t tobacco companies. And somehow the the subtle effect of the settlement was that um, they switched sides from being this let's say anti-government thing to um, to sort of a um, an extension of the state. So I think there are some kind of plausible dynamics here. I think you believe in more of a significant quote conspiracy than I do, but I would say I don't think that let's just say as an emergent as an emergent feature. Okay, okay. So, but I don't really. I'm not sure what makes you think I'm arguing for them as universally heroes because what I'm focused on in my work is that the act of producing hydrocarbons is a moral act. And in fact, I spend a lot of time castigating the industry for being very weak and adopting different things. And I guess also, I don't, I don't think of the industry as fundamentally separate from the culture. I talk about our knowledge system and how we have this thing called the anti-impact mm -hmm. framework, which mm -hmm. is basically the belief that human impact on nature is immoral and self-destructive. And, and one of my criticisms of the industry is that the business people often accept those ideas uh, uncritically. And I think I, I think there is some opportunism. And I think in general, business people tend to be opportunistic, particularly if they don't have total moral clarities. And I think you see, I mean, certainly with the European mm -hmm. super majors, I think it's just, there's a lot of, a lot of cravenness. But I, I do try to articulate, well, some of these people can be craven, but the core thing they're doing is moral. And where I've seen that manifested is I think a lot of the independents have really resonated with what I'm doing. It's not like ExxonMobil is calling mm -hmm. me up all the time. No, we totally love you. But um, I, I do think there's a real core of virtue. And I also do think that there have been a lot of people who haven't had the right arguments and have benefited. So what we've seen since Moral Case for Fossil Fuels is we had a decent number of CEOs who now stand up and are more articulate. There's this guy, Adam Anderson, who stood up to the North Face. Did you, I don't know if you followed that mm -hmm. controversy. There's a guy named Chris Wright out of Liberty Energy, a guy named Bud Brigham. There's a number of different people who f found resonance in the arguments that I was making and made them and are now defending their industry in a more principled way. So I don't think it's, I don't think everyone is automatically virtuous by association, but I do think the core is good. And I think there are. I think it's worth engaging the people who really but I, believe. But that. I would. But I would. Um, I would uh, telescope this out a bit. So um, even let's let's agree with everything you just said there for the sake of argument. The uh, the the place where um, people feel uncomfortable about it is that uh, so much of the oil production at this point, it's not oil majors or smaller oil companies in the U.S. It is. Um, it is uh, in these sort of you know authoritarian um, third world governments. Yeah. And, um, and there's, you know, maybe, maybe the oil curse is somewhat exaggerated, but there, there is some degree to which, um, you know, all these countries are, um, you know, uh, they underperform relative to the bonanza they should get from oil. Norway is the most dysfunctional of the Scandinavian welfare states. And, you know, Equatorial Guinea is really messed up as a country. And, uh, and Saudi Arabia, you know, it's it's not really the magic. You know, it's 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 like a it's a smoke and mirrors ta mm -hmm. tale from a thousand and one nights. And and there was some intuition, you know, in the 1970s and 80s when when these environmental things started to to really gain traction, that um, if we didn't find some way um, to dial it back, you were um, you were in some ways empowering what people deem to be. The worst um, actors in the world, and you know they, they're, they're probably not willing to make a moral argument about Islamic fundamentalism in Saudi Arabia. That's that's an uncomfortable argument for people to make, um, and so they made a displaced argument about about oil being dirty or something like this. But that is the that, that's, that's pretty charitable. Or the uh, green uh, I think they were, you know. I, I, I think, mean, maybe but, some people, maybe like Thomas Friedman or something like that. But this was where I think you had a, you know, a fairly again this is it's it's very complicated what the politics around climate change were but there, there was probably there was probably um a neocon part of the US establishment that um you know that uh that became skeptical of 
uh, that became sort of pro uh, pro climate change as a way to you know to weaken these these countries that were at odds with the U.S. and the Middle East and, and things well, like that. I mean, I think the test of any honesty on this issue is how did they feel when we had the shale revolution in the U.S. Because some of the people were some of the security types were enthusiastic about it, and some were like, no, no, we shouldn't be doing this sure. either. I mean, the the foreign policy thing is is a real issue, and it's it's a fascinating thing. But I think it's important that we I think we had a very appeasing foreign policy toward these nations. I mean, with basically every single one, if you read the prize by Jurgen, there was some agreement set that we could have enforced. We certainly had the military power mm -hmm. to enforce these deals. You know, from Sa you know Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Venezuela, all these different places. And we allowed dictators to totally violate the terms of yes. these deals, nationalize it. I think that put our country in disrepute, made us seem very weak. And we empowered these despots. So yeah, I mean, it, basically, if you give a huge amount of money to a despot, that can be a curse for the people. But you see in Texas, I don't think Texas has an oil curse. Yeah, look, I, th I think but I think this can be true on different levels. So it's, it's true that the 2010s fracking revolution has... Um, probably been an important component or the sine qua non for the U.S. having a somewhat less interventionist foreign policy. And then after the fracking revolution, we got you know, more and more entangled with these governments. But then on, on some other scale level, you know, we were so entangled with them in the 80s, 90s, 2000s that, uh, that maybe if you wanted to disentangle, you had to first you know, listen to Greta and start riding a bicycle or something like that. And, it, and so it can work on both. both I don't, but I just want to say, I don't agree with it. I don't think of it in terms of intervention versus not in, intervention or entanglement versus not, because I think it's, did we have a pro-America foreign policy where we actually defended our interests and our contracts or not? And I think we had a, sacri a sacrificial policy where we empowered these dictators and then we sort of entangled ourselves like a George W. Bush feels like he has to be you know, the crown prince's special friend and have chicken with him in Crawford, yeah. Texas, I, because we've so weakened ourselves. I don't, I don't want to beat this to death, but I, I was anchoring more, more on the morality question where um, where um, the common sense intuition is that, um, you know, maybe they're not like absolutely evil, but we, we don't think of, um, of a lot of these countries as uh, the most uh, moral actors. We don't think of them as, um, you know, um, respecting property rights, respecting basic capitalist principles. And so there was there was something about um, this world that was very entangled with fossil fuels where we had to be, you know, we were forced to be morally neutral about these these players. It was like the Germany issue with with Russia on the pipeline, where um, the way people talk, you know, it's a complicated debate, but, but um, the pipeline always came with not making moral judgments about Putin. It's right. just, you know, and... Um, Maybe we shouldn't have made that many. Maybe we should have made more. But um, there was something about uh, about the the um, OPEC fossil fuel centered world where um, you were not supposed to make moral judgments about the biggest of these oil countries. It would it would be too disruptive to do that. Yeah. So my view is you should have made moral judgments when they stole the oil and they violate, and you should have condemned that and stopped that from mm -hmm. happening. And then you could have preempted this. One other thing is I think an un another honesty test is. Are the people concerned about oil? Are they looking for real alternatives, not just nuclear, but are they interested in coal conversion, natural gas conversion? Because coal and natural gas, we have like limitless amounts of in the US. Oil is very special in terms of how mm -hmm. dependent we are, particularly on the Middle East. And one interesting shift is the Democrats, unfortunately, because you look at the late 70s, they're at least interested in, hey, how do we have synthetic mm -hmm. fuels from coal? And, and, and interest, supposedly interested in domestic production. Unfortunately, by 2020, you get to the point where we've actually achieved a lot of domestic production and they want to they wanna stop it. So, so I don't sure. think that's very, that's not sincere. Sure, look, uh, look the, 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 the version of it that I always zero in on is the nuclear one. I, you know, I, th I think there is, you know, there's a lot of complexity around um, the costs of the, of the sin fuels. It, it, uh, I think it never quite got economical. Then there's a counter argument where where uh, maybe um, it was because you late, um, um, burdened it with too many environmental regulations, um, but it was sort of some. But but the you know the, the one that I keep thinking is you know is just cleaner. Um, no matter what you think, you yeah, know, on, I, on, I on agree. Climate I mean, change is, is nuclear, and and the amazing one is that that one, you know, is you know we have had not we've had I believe there's not been a single we had a few nuclear reactors built over the last 40 years, but not a single new design has been approved. 
and you know if you can't if you can't innovate, you know, you're probably not going to get nuclear to work, and uh, you're not going to get if you're not going to get nuclear to work. I think I think you're not going to get the energy future to work at all. So that's the, I, I would always zero in on the nuclear thing a lot more. Yeah. Uh, Mitterrand's big focus, I mean, I think with nuclear, the, a big thing is just getting the policy right. And I think a lot of people have criticisms of the establishment, but there's a question of what should nuclear policy be? And that's that's kind of one of the frontiers of my my work now. It's it's probably, yeah, it's, it's um, uh, well, it's it's certainly certainly my my instinct and maybe it's too facile on my part, but it's always my instinct that when people, when people, um, you know, if people are concerned about climate change, all these things, um, if they're not wildly pro-nuclear, I, um, I'm always biased to think they're simply acting out of bad faith. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's the litmus test, particularly if you take it as a category, because it's one thing to say, oh, this particular reactor, I've, but being against fissioning. Sure. In, in, as such, or even using nuclei sure. as such, that is just a giveaway if you have, even like we have Robert F. Kennedy, you know, who's sort of become a mini darling of some parts of the right, but like, you just listen to him, like he has a generic hostility toward anything nuclear. And I think that that betrays very anti-technology perspective. It was all perspective. these, it was all the original environmental debates from the 70s and somehow the people who came of age during that time never learned anything new. Yeah. So let's talk about the green movement a little bit. I don't know how much, I, I think we might have different theories, but this is a really interesting question of just why has the green movement been so successful? I think why questions are always very overdetermined and there, there are a lot of reasons for it. But, and I often like to talk about this in a European context where I think it's been the, um, the most successful and the strongest. And I, I always think that you take Germany or sort of any sort of continental European country there's sort of a question about the future and you wanna concretize it with these different pictures of the future. And, and my rough argument is there are three um, concrete versions of the future that people can imagine. The first one, and the, the future is a time that will look different from the present. So it's not an endless groundhog day where we just kick the can down the road and nothing ever changes. It's, um, it's a point where, the, um, where things look different. So, Picture number one in Western Europe is it'll be under Islamic Sharia law and every woman gets to wear a burqa. Uh, picture number two is um, it'll be the um, Chinese communist AI controls everybody and it will be a totalitarian, surve totalitarian surveillance state. And then behind door number three is Greta and everybody drives a bicycle. And, um, and there's a, and to the extent you frame it as one of those three futures, I think the green one will be the most charismatic, the most pleasant. It's basically, it's sort of the same as now, except it'll be cleaner and the other ones are, are truly dystopian. And then I, and then I think uh, that on this, let's say the right of center pro-tech side, um, we, don't have, we don't have a story of the future that, um, that is compelling, that's charismatic to people, and uh, and we're always, you know, and that's that's roughly why my analysis why why someone like Greta has been been winning. You know, there are there are specific ones that they can work on the level of a company. So I know my former PayPal colleague Elon Musk has built a terrific company with SpaceX, and the vision was, you know, you're going to go to Mars, and that you know inspires thousands of aerospace engineers to work at SpaceX. It's it's not quite, you know, the project that um, that motivates the United States, and it, it, it's, it's in that sense, it's it's it works on the level of a company. It doesn't work on the level of our, of our whole society. And this is this is also where I'm, you know, a little bit critical of your term, human flourishing. Well, let's, let's wait on is, that. Let's wait okay. on that one because I don't right. want to talk. So, I I guess it's. Do you let, why, why don't you, yeah, why don't you go through your your version of why. Why, 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 let's, and again, maybe it's unfair to always pick on the autistic child, Greta, but, um, yeah, but why I, has Greta been winning? Yeah, I don't, I don't sort of narrow it to her, because, because for me, the, the thing is, how have we gotten to the point where the number one moral and political goal espoused in the world is the rapid elimination of fossil fuels? Like, to me, that, because I, I think we should be using more for the foreseeable future. So I think, like, that's, 
And uh, you know, part of my argument is, well, beneath that is this very deep hostility toward human impact. And I think in general, what I call the anti-impact movement, the modern environmental movement, they tend to fixate on the form of impact. So I think they're impact haters, but they tend to fixate on the one that will get them the most restriction on yeah, impact. Let me cut you off. I, let's, let's say I agree, I agree with all of that. Okay. The, the, qu the question I think we should be trying to engage with more is, why, why does this work? Or why, why isn't, like, I'm convinced of your argument, but, well, it, well, doesn't, okay, but it, it doesn't convince other people. Let's and why, why, why does it? Well, but I think that, so there's a question of, I mean, my argument is kind of, is still pretty new and it, it convinces sure. an increasing sure. number of people. So I'm not yet convinced that it, it hasn't reached a stopping point yet. But, but part of it is, okay, let's take a couple of things. One is, I think one is there is a very strong move on the left or the, you know, the statists in the 60s and 70s to make, to sort of oppose capitalism on environmental grounds. And you know, this was, was documented mm -hmm. at the time Ayn Rand discusses it in her book, The New Left, The mm -hmm. Anti-Industrial Revolution. And the, the, you know, part of the impetus was, well, they don't have, they can't really claim communism outproduces mm -hmm. uh, capitalism. They don't have a co the concrete of the Vietnam War for very much longer, like, oh, it causes war and stuff. And so they need a new cause. And they, they can't claim productive superiority, but they can claim this issue of, well, capitalism is bad for the environment. And I think environment is just an incredibly powerful value to people because it's it's where we live. Mm -hmm. And we have attachments to natural beauty. We have attachments to our, you know, our environment from the perspective of health. And I think the statist side really associated themselves with, we are going to give you a good environment and we are gonna protect you against all these ravages of capitalism on environment. And I think the capitalist response was mostly to try to refute specific claims, but not to take the high ground of saying, no, actually we give you mm -hmm. a better environment because we give you property rights, which helps with clean air and clean water, but we also give you energy and production, which makes the naturally unlivable environment or barely livable environment livable for billions of people. So I, th I think it was a huge move rhetorically to own the issue of environment. And I think pro-freedom people have generally conceded that issue. But I think, I think ever we, should, since. we should steel man it just a little bit more, you know, where steel man which. The, the, the environmentalists or why, why they got so much traction. And I think, you know, I think I want to say it's something like um, you're Ayn Rand, you're pro-tech. It's not appealing enough. It's just, OK, we can we can we can double our economy and we can double the population. And um, it's, it's like the uh, Dustin Hoffman movie from the late 60s, The Graduate. And, you know, he gets told oh, what you're supposed to go into is plastics. And and that was plastics were the future in 1955. And by 1968, yeah, maybe we needed more plastics, but it-, it Yeah, it, we sure as hell needed more plastics in 1968. But, but it all felt, you know, there, there was a way in which this, this felt exhausted. I, you know, I, I was, you know, I was, I was a kid in the seventies and I remember, you know, I remember being in LA and it was, you know, it was, it was really polluted and it was getting, the pollution was getting, you know, um, it was, it was steadily getting worse. And there, there was some sense that you couldn't be on this thing. Now, I, th I think what happened was, you know, it, it pivoted way too far in this dialing it back direction. But what I'm saying like the other, but part of this will go, maybe we should talk about human flourishing in a minute, but this, what I'm saying is that the pro-freedom side isn't owning the issue of environment, but part of it means means valuing it properly. So if you talk mm -hmm. about economics in a vacuum, and you just say, okay, we want to produce more and more and more. We just, all we want to do is produce more sure. and more and more, but it's not, you're not looking at life in a holistic way. Then you run into the challenge of, well, some people will take a huge aspect of life, like environmental quality, natural beauty. They'll own that and they'll say, oh, there's this dichotomy. And so you guys, you guys just want LA to become more polluted. Whereas I would say that, the truly freedom position is no, no, no. As we become more evolved technologically, we can have higher and higher pollution standards because we have the technological and economic ability to set them, unlike the caveman where you can't set pollution standards for him because all he can live by mm -hmm. is fire. But if we, um, but is, is anything holistic? Isn't that, is, you know, is, is holism, like you're flourishing, yeah. human flourishing, isn't that just a code word for statism? 
because um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's like when, when you say, you know, we need to be holistic about things. It's yeah. like we need to take the big picture. We need to take into account not just the shareholders, but all the stakeholders. Right. And then we're, we're in, you know, European social democracy where companies don't exist to make profits. That's too narrow. That's not holistic enough. And that becomes the all purpose excuse for, um, you know, this ever larger, ever more intrusive um, a state getting its, you know, ca it's the camel's nose under the tent or whatever. Well, there's a question of, well, let's first talk so about that, it. This, I just have an allergic reaction no, I, I to understand. holism. I have an but, allergic but, reaction but I, to But flourishing. I think, well, but I think that, that some others have an allergic reaction. I think that's an impediment. So, but let's just talk, let's talk about it individually and then ha how to handle it societally. Because individually, presumably you're not against holism, right? It's not like, like you have different things like family, friends, like you want a life that's integrated and that has different aspects to it that hopefully fit together. It's not just, you're not optimizing one aspect to the exclusion of everything um, else. Absol absolutely, but but we're here, here I think we're talking about public policy. And, oh, but, 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 then, but, it, but it starts, right, but, but you have to acknowledge that people think about their, they're first and foremost thinking about their lives and they're thinking about their lives holistically. So then there's a question of how to account for that in public policy. And I think the main way is defining rights properly. But rights have to, I mean, just take pollution. So how do you decide what standards to set for pollution? It has to factor in the need for production and human life. That's a fundamental need. And it also has to factor in, well, at a certain level of pollution, it interferes with people living their lives. And that's why I think you, you know, different areas even can set legitimately different pollution standards. But I think properly they are thinking of the lives of the citizens in a holistic way. That's different from saying, like one dictator should factor in, should should think holistically about everyone and treat everyone as expendable. But it's like, how do you set the conditions for individuals to flourish? Uh, surely, and I, th I think we would agree on a lot of the particulars, um, but uh, but it's not as simple as just saying you have these rights in a vacuum. You know, if, it, it, if, we, if we're gonna regulate carbon emissions, it's probably best to do it with a carbon trading market because a market's still a better way I would agree with that. than a non-market. Although in practice, um, you, if you have an international carbon trading market, you know, do you end up with a situation where Nigeria is exporting carbon credits for all the trees it's planting in the Sahara Desert and that it never even plants? And you end up, you know, um, you, and then you need, and then in practice you need, you know, some fairly powerful governmental monitoring schemes and you end up with a very top heavy state well, to make the, it really The work. carbon thing is, yeah, the carbon thing so is example, a mess. I'm saying, saying theoretically, but we'll take it more locally, right? Because you can have it with just more local air pollution where I think a rights-based theory would say, yeah, there, we determine there's a certain threshold at which like given the state of technology and resources and stuff, we um, like this is the amount of emissions we want in LA on a given day. And I think there like you can set and so you sort of set a threshold and then you have to decide sort of how do people get to contribute to that? Maybe it's, maybe it's all the existing cars. The, 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 the local version of this that I'm, I'm very focused on where things seem incredibly off to me, incredibly hard to fix are just basic zoning laws. And, um, and you know, the, the naive version would be you have a house, you have some property, you should be able to build more um, you should be able to de develop it. Mm -hmm. uh, you should have control over that. And then in practice, those property rights have been massively dialed back by zoning laws. And there's some complicated trade-off argument because, you know, if you build a 20-story skyscraper on your, in your, to replace your single-family house, it'll cast too much of a shadow on the neighbors. Right. And, and then, um, but then in practice, it's, it's not that we have these rights that get freely traded or somehow uh, adjudicated by the market. In practice, we end up with um, this... Um, you know, NIMBY zoning structure, where if you look out the window here, um, it would not have looked different 30, 40 years ago. We're in one of the newest office buildings. It was built in 1964, three years before I was born. And uh, and that's, and if, if we can't even get zoning to work, but, 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 how are we well, gonna get anything but to I, well, I'm like not in this? favor of handling that, but maybe a broader point is, I think pro-freedom people need, this is a big professional focus of mine now is like, what are the actual pro-freedom policies that would work and also how to persuade people? But I think there's a lot of work to think these things through in terms of how do you think through, you know, homeowners associations and property rights so that we can have 
so that, that people can actually act and innovate. Yeah, it's, I mean, we can't even build new roads now. I mean, it's just, it's so stagnant um, and, and shameful. But I think, I think it's those, the way those policies are made have to take into account that people do think about their lives holistically. So it can't just be, well, we just let everyone do whatever they want and we don't really have an answer to it. Yeah, well, neither, neither was advocating that. Right, but, but I'm I, just saying like- I'm, I, I don't want to deflect to zoning arguments from energy policy, yeah. but I, I think that is, it seems to me that should be the easier one to fix is zoning policy. And it is, it's so far outside of it and we can, we can debate forever how to micro adjust it and it will never get through the city council in LA or most, most of our towns. And there are all sorts of deep structural reasons yeah. why it is like that. And maybe the best thing you can do is move to a different city, but you know, there are also reasons you don't yeah, want to and do I, that. I know nothing about persuading people about zoning. I, I'm more, up, we'll mm -hmm. talk about optimism about energy, but okay, let's talk about this human flourishing issue. So what's, I use, I mean, why global human flourishing, of course. So I use this term a lot. I, I used it, some in moral case, I use it a lot more in fossil future. You indicated some- I came up with this ad hominem argument on the spot, which was okay. Leon Cass start using that one. What's that, that? Yeah, my, my ad hominem argument. Oh yeah, argument, when we were talking, yeah, that, that had form. a big impact on me actually. Cause well, you want to give the context of Leon Cass? Well, I, you, neither you, of us you, like- You mentioning her human flourishing and I was just thinking to myself, I thought this guy, um, this, you know, this sort of, uh, whatever, um, super restrictionist uh, bioethicist who wants yeah. to do nothing good for humans is not in favor of human flourishing in any sense the way I would define the term, used human flourishing nonstop. And isn't he the person who first coined the word or used it, or at least my my reference, and then we double checked it and he- He, uh, he uses something like 23 times over the head with book. it nonstop yeah. too. And so- Yeah, and I hate the book. And so it. if it can be hijacked that easily, we have to be careful about a word like that. They have to be careful. So, so this, but I think, so the reason I like it, it it's not, it can be, it can definitely be abused, but I think what we definitely need is a concept for a good in human life or success in human life. That is to use this term holistic. That's really capturing what people want as a combination of the material and the mental and an integrated combination. When you talk about flourishing, like flowering, it's something living to its highest potential. I think that it's important to have that as, as a concept. And I think in different contexts, you need to specify it. So in, in my work, I'm talking more about material aspects of it. And you know, I talk about a couple of different things. If I'm talking about a world, I talk about like we want a world that's nourishing in that it's pretty easy to acquire nourishment versus very difficult. It's safe, it's pretty easy to protect yourself from your surroundings versus difficult. And then opportunity field. You have the opportunity to pursue your version of you know, flourishing or of fulfillment maybe is a better term in that context. In, in other contexts, and I think it, I think it's it's a good starting point. I think people, and then people should have debates within that. But it, the other thing is it differentiates, in my context, it differentiates my view of energy from the view that our, we should be optimizing for less impact. Because I, I do think that's the dominant framework for how people think about energy. As I said, the number one goal in the world today is some form of net zero, like get rid of our impact. So I think when the dominant way of thinking about energy and, and industry and environment is, let's impact it as little as possible. It's powerful to say, no, no, we need human flourishing. And then we can talk about, okay, the details of that. Do we have a more individualist version, a collectivist version? But human flourishing stands in stark contrast to eliminating human impact. And I don't think Greta would say, I agree we should make the earth the best possible place for human flourishing. Well, but I, I can imagine all these other contexts where it would get hijacked. You know, it, it, if you have some crazed woke high school Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's like, and the parents are saying, you know, I want to measure, uh, how much, uh, our kids are learning reading and, you know, whether they're tracking to calculus by 12th grade and then the stick with which you beat up the parents is, well, we're interested in the holistic development of your children and right. human flourishing in general. And, uh, and so it's, it's, and, you know, I, I, again, maybe, uh, we shouldn't fixate as much as we are on Greta, but I think even Greta could be trained to use the human flourishing term and the, you know, and it would be some easy pivot where, well, we need a planet for there to be human flourishing and everything I'm doing is the sine qua non for human flourishing. And, um, and then, you know, just Alex doesn't understand 
that if you don't, you don't have a planet, you don't have an economy, well, and, the, and it's, it's all so high They have so that high argument. And I talk about that. I mean, this is delicate nurture view of Earth, but it still doesn't come across as, I think when you really push it as like, is our goal with the Earth to advance human flourishing on Earth? Like, Greta will not endorse that. Like she'll say we should eliminate human impact on Earth and she'll think of it as, well, we'll benefit somehow because we won't destroy the Earth. But she, Greta, is, Greta does not stand for human flourishing. I mean, she's, she does not look like she's flourishing. She doesn't sound like she's flourishing. She's unhappy. She doesn't want to be happy. Like it's really kind of avoiding this collective apocalypse toward humans and nature. And it, what's interesting is, you know, the right for better or worse, sometimes worse, has adopted human flourishing a lot more. I think some of my influence, I'm not sure of the distribution. Uh, the, the Greens have not. They don't use that term. I mean, I think at some point they'll start attacking it, but well, they let's, don't. Let's, let, me, let me try to agree with you a little bit, but push this in some, okay. some different direction. So let's say that, um, you know, human impact is somehow stressing the negatives and we're trying to avoid these these negatives, human flourishing is stressing the positives. And let's let's agree that Greta and the radical environmentalists and, and a lot of other people, you know, don't don't weigh the positives enough. Um, but then, you know, where, you know, the, the kind of holistic argument they always come back to is, you know, how does one think about existential risks, these sort of precautionary principles, and maybe, you know, maybe it's not something you can um, you can always micro adjust, and if we, you know, there's some point where you get to a point of no return, you get it so wrong, you know, the whole society comes to an end, and that's, and so yes, yeah, so I, I I think they are more negatively oriented. I think it has this, you know, dystopian apocalyptic undercurrent, and it is just, you know, we're scared, we're depressed about the future, and we're not promising a great human flourishing story like you are, Alex, but we're just, you know. We're just uh, you know, going to try to stop the world coming to an end, and um, and then and then in a weird way, you you should be able to win that argument or win that debate. The radical greens do surprisingly well because people's expectations are are so low for the future. You know, if you, if you tell a millennial, a Gen Xer, you know, you have you'll do as well as your boomer parents. That's a, you know that doesn't sound great to me. But that, that in some sense, that's, 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 that's almost too wildly optimistic in, in the context and realities of, you know, the United States in 2023. So, I, but I think of this as more the view of the earth and human nature. So, you know, I, I talk about the, the big contrasts are advancing human, like if you're evaluating the earth, are you evaluating it from the perspective of your goal is to advance human flourishing on earth or eliminate human impact on it? That's, one axis, and then the other axis, which is related is, do you view the earth as a delicate nurturer where human beings are parasite polluters? Or do you, do you view it as wild potential where human beings are producer improvers? And I think this second one needs a lot of clarity too. I've, I'm actually optimistic in my experience. You can pretty quickly convince people to have a very different view of the earth. In terms of, you mentioned that abstract argument about resources, but just the idea that resources are created, just make, make the point as aluminum, a valuable natural resource. Everyone will say yes, because it's so abundant, but it, it's not naturally a resource. Oil isn't naturally a resource. Uranium. And just to go in one philosophic question, you're, you're sort of a um, unreconstructed Ayn Rand type person or Love almost it. unreconstructed. Yes. And so human nature is actually not that strong. It's not that well defined the way I understand the, the Randian view. It's, it's sort of like, it's a very abstract thing. You know, a human being is maybe a you know, self-creating, being or, or something like that, but it's 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 not it's not like some Thomistic set of things that precisely define human nature. So, what what do you, as a Randian, mean by human nature? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. I but I'm not sure what the contrast is. So, you, like you're saying, well, it's, it's determined it's, versus not, or specific. Well, I always, versus I'm always not. I'm always uh, I'm always a little bit nervous with nature, is you know, as a standard, is is nature the standard that we measure things by, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what does that, what does that actually tell us? And especially vis-a-vis -vis human beings, like, you know, maybe there's a, you know, there's some, you know, I don't know, there's some natural standard of how the laws of nature work or, you know, um, you know, you, um, you, you know, you don't, you don't have to fly because it violates the law of gravity mm -hmm. for, if you don't have wings or, so there's sort of all sorts of ways one can use um, 
but then I, I don't know how one uses nature as a standard with respect to human beings. Well, it's not, well, it's not a standard. So it's just, it's, it's, but I, I feel it's, it has some, it's supposed to have some normative force in the way in which you're using it or is it? Yeah. Well, it has normative force in that it tells you the causal relation. It, I mean, specifically it tells you about the causal relationships that you need to understand to achieve some outcome, right? So if you understand like the nature of life is such that you have to transform nature to meet your needs, that's a, then that, which is really the heart of productivity, that tells you that productivity is a, na is a virtue if your goal is for human beings to flourish. But, but, then, it, but then, then why, uh, why, why, why shouldn't we just make productivity the standard or GDP the standard? Well, but this, this like but that, this goes to the issue of it, a holistic thing of it. I said it's a crucial virtue, but there's a question of what if if the end is a happy life or a flourishing life. The idea is there are multiple necessary causal inputs in that. And the other way in which you start study nature is you sort of understand the nature of the being you are, including how happiness works, how emotions mm -hmm. work, et cetera. In terms of you know the Randy and her objectivist view, I think she's good at not claiming to understand every aspect of human nature. And, and her view is philosophy is, is focused on certain essentials that then other fields mm -hmm. will, will work with. So for example, even the idea like, reason is man's basic tool of survival. It's like, that's a key aspect of nature. Uh, reason is volitional, which is that's a more controversial issue, you know, like human beings mm -hmm. actually have choice. And then there's an account of what is the nature of choice versus what's, uh, what's not chosen. I mean, even something like politically, like freedom is the social precondition for exercising mm -hmm. reason. But it's, it's trying to identify these universal timeless fundamentals that we can then both, we can use to discover other things. So for example, like, it's useful for a psychology for a psychologist to know that reason is man's basic tool of survival, but Ayn Rand doesn't have a full theory of human psychology I, and what to do yep. in these situations. And I guess, I guess there's a part of me that is very sympathetic to that, and then the part of me that gets very nervous about it is as soon because my look ahead function is immediately to what does this mean for public policy, politics, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, for on an individual level, I would agree that um, you know if human beings are more rational uh, at the margins, they're likely to be happier and have more flourishing lives, and um, and they have some control over that, some freedom to to choose um, to live more rational lives, and then um, and that all sounds good to me, and then um, as soon as um, you know as soon as we say well maybe the state should um, help people be a little bit more rational. Um, I'm, you know, we're on the road to North Korea. And so the, 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 the framing. It, it, right. It, but, but then, there, but the, I mean, there's a, people are, I mean, people can read, um, an essay by, cause I don't want to just focus on her, but what is capitalism? Her essay in the book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. That's her most fundamental thing on capitalism. I think, yeah, it's, it's not like even think individually, like, do I think, Hey, I really need Cass Sunstein to hold a gun to my head to tell me how to be happier. Like, no, I don't. Sure. If he has a good, if Cass Sunstein has a good idea, he can find my email but okay, but and let's, give me a good idea. Go, let me go back to the question. What, is, how, what does human flourishing do in, in your thing? If it's, just, if it's just something that obviously makes sense on an individual level, that's good. Mm -hmm. if, it's a, if it's a standard for policymakers, that feels fuzzy and therefore dangerous to me. I and see, so yes. Who, you know, so if you're, yeah, if you're appealing to people's rational self-interest and you know you want to have a flourishing life and it's in your no. power to do that you know if I you're see. jordan peterson and this is your approach to self-help that's all good it's a better better than jordan peterson <laughs> and then um and then if it's but if it's um if it is um you're uh you're in the epa and did you know that you're in charge of human flourishing right uh this is a formula for mischief so okay really glad you brought this up because i think this is this is a really important thing so when I'm talking about human flourishing as a basis for policy, I think it's overwhelmingly in the realm of what we can call environmental policy. Because when we're thinking about, so you just take the example, if we're thinking about something like air pollution, I think in defining what, and because I, I believe in a rights-based framework for all this stuff, but in defining like what level of pollution violates a right or, or not, 
ultimately the way to determine that is to think, you have to think about life in a holistic way in terms of, hey, what's going to lead to human flourishing? So it's, you're defining the rights to say, okay, this is, this is a level of this pollution. This is what, this is what constitutes like trespassing on your neighbor versus not. You're, you're sort of deriving the rights from an understanding of human flourishing, but you recognize that the key to individual flourishing is, is freedom of action within defined, within defined spheres. So the last thing you want is some dictator who arbitrarily gets to say on a case by case level, oh, this is what you need to flourish, this is what you need to flourish. So I think the, the concept of human flourishing is used in the determination of rights in these kinds of environmental um, issues. The other way in which I think it's important is insofar as we're broadly debating, like across different political philosophies, what to do about energy, um, I think for every political philosophy, there's a question of, are you looking at it from a pro-human way or an anti-human way? And whatever your political philosophy is, even if you're collectivist, you should be looking at it in a pro-human way. So I'm so in my philosophy, when I work on energy policy, I'm always applying human flourishing to what, what rights. Do, what do people actually say to you? I'm, I'm, I'm because um, I don't think they I don't think they ever say we're really anti-human. Or if, if if you if they if you actually get them to say that, okay, you, you're you've I've, won, I've mate and one, mate and one, checkmate. Uh huh. Um, thank, and I mean, you you want to debate that person all day long, and right, you right. just keep them on a short leash and have them right. say that on command every day. Right. But I don't, I don't think they actually say that. So how do they how do they deflect from this? So one is they'll caricature what it means to be on a human flourishing standard. So they'll treat it as in one, they'll treat it as short range. So they'll just say, oh, well, you're not thinking about the future. Well, so no, no, wait a second. I'm, I am thinking about the you're future. You're holistic, but not holistic enough. Right, exactly. So it's basically, or they'll say, you're not thinking wide ranging. And if you're mm -hmm. not thinking about ecosystems, you know, like you think about ecosystems, but it's not every living thing has an equal right that we care equally about. It's we're optimizing the ecosystem for human beings. And most people do not, most people will not optimize their thinking about earth for human beings. So there's there's the kind of your short range, your narrow. But the other thing which you brought up earlier is this is some version of delicate nurture always comes up. It's basically if you think in terms of human flourishing, you're going to cause human destruction because the earth is fragile. So the idea is no, if we eliminate our impact, somehow we'll sort of accidentally get human flourishing. I mean that's that's what people are doing now. It's like if we, we let's let's let me focus ask about one ambiguity there. It's um, is human Flourishing about human beings individually or human beings collectively. I don't and, think I don't make a separation. Yeah, and I think in theory there's no separation, but in practice I would argue there is because if you, um, you know, if you look at them individually, you would probably focus, you know, on on the human beings currently in existence. Whereas if you think about them collectively, there's some version where you get into thinking about. Um, all the human beings from now till the year 3000 and beyond. And then, you know, in theory, that's um, a more holistic perspective. And yeah, in practice, I, I hate EA. And I in practice, it's, it's a formula for endless mischief. Or just, you yeah. Because so I, think, I think of, I mean, this is a, a big yeah, subject. I have a, but, I have a, but, I have a lot against no, EA no, as well. But, but uh, look, yeah. I'm happy to talk about it. But I think it's like, I mean, basically, so I'm, I'm also not utilitarian. So mm -hmm. like if an individualist view of human flourishing, mm -hmm. is the effectively utilit, I mean, I think, let's put it this way, the anti-impact movement is the, taken literally and seriously is the ultimate form of human sacrifice. Because it's basically saying sacrifice for the sake of an unimpacted planet. It's not, mm -hmm. Whereas you have all these other seemingly pro-human things that end up being anti-human. Mm -hmm. So in utilitarianism, it's, oh, Peter Thiel, you exist for the greatest happiness, for the greatest number. So if, if they decide to kill you like Socrates, if they say it makes us feel good to kill Peter Thiel, that's okay. Like, that's not my version at all. But then the Peter Singer effective altruist is, okay, well, Peter Singer's alleged genius contribution was to bring in all of these other animals that we actually can't peacefully coexist with and say, well, we should factor in their, quote, happiness. Versus human beings, we can beneficially coexist with. So respecting their rights is good for us. Respecting the, quote, rights of other animals is harmful. To it. So he's done that, and now he's part of this movement to consider the imagined interests of humans indefinitely in the future. And what this all leads to is just an unlimited license to sacrifice individuals mm. and to consider their lives uh, unimportant and their rights non-existent. And you look at like a McCaskill type. I mean, 
their thinking is such crap, if, if you know about any of the issues, like about yeah, look, climate. I, 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 on some level, I, um, you're being way too kind to these people. Oh. And I, I, find it, I find it hard to even think that they're acting you know, in, in good faith. And it is, I don't know, it's like some, I attempt to go towards some weird ad hominem sociological commentary where mm. if we have, it's like some ca capitalist communist fusion product that's very desirable in our society where someone like Sam Bankman Freed says he's gonna be the world's first trillionaire and it's okay because he's an effective altruist. He's gonna give everybody on the planet $100. And, um, and then there is, you know, there is a theoretical discussion about whether this is um, a good way to build the future and morally correct. And then I, cannot, I, can't even get to, I can't even get to that because I just don't believe any of it. I just, I, I just think it was, it was all a fraud. And, and there's something, and then, but, you and know, if people are you're, you're, you're the better person. By, by the way, if people are interested in this, you um, if you, you search Ayn Rand Institute Effective Altruism, I used to work there and some of my colleagues have talked about this. I think they have some good stuff, but I think it is, um, part of the reason I'm focusing on this within human flourishing is the thing I do need to distinguish myself from is all the forms of human sacrifice, mm -hmm. of individual sacrifice that masquerade as a kind of collective, including future collective mm -hmm. human flourishing. That is a battle that needs to be fought. It's not my primary battle because mm -hmm. my primary battle is against people who want to sacrifice human flourishing to unimpacted mm -hmm. nature. But yeah, within it, sort of as a per, just so I don't talk about EA much publicly because it's not my, it, it's not exactly relevant to my expertise, except when they just say, like they're, they make all the errors I talk about in terms of fossil fuel. So they just, they just look at negative side effects. They totally treat earth as delicate nurturer. I mean, if, if you're actually thinking about the future and you quote care about the future, the number one thing you want is more human capability. You can counter that in certain ways, but in general, you want the capability where if you have another pandemic, you can deal with it. If you have a climate problem, you can master the climate. Like that's what we need to be doing. That's what we, all the people in the past who benefited us gave us more capabilities. That's what they did. They didn't harm us by consuming resources. They benefited us by, by um, giving us capabilities. And this whole movement is telling us basically undercut your ability to have new capabilities yeah, because I it's going to benefit your hundred generations down the future. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to, yeah, I, I, I love your framing of, you know, this, we, we should always have an allergic reaction when we hear talk of sacrifice, self-sacrifice, all these different forms of sacrificial logic. And, you know, I, I think it would be healthy if we had some kind of psychological reaction to it where uh, our assumption is the people who talk in that sort of lingo are sociopathic, it's, it, of, and it's, it's just sociopathy gone wild. And that's what, that's the, that would be the healthy reaction whenever we hear that. I, I think, well, what do you think about the, do you think there's a power lust element to that? You, you've read Fountainhead, right? Like, like the Ellsworth mm -hmm. Toohey kind of character. I mean, there's this view of like, the person who calls for sacrifice wants to be the master. I wish there was an impulse toward that as well. Where do they see like, oh, you're saying we should all sacrifice. Oh, we should all sacrifice to you. They, they made that assumption that that's yeah, it part is, of what's going on. It's somehow, um, I, don't, I don't think you ever have a sacrificial logic in which it's truly egalitarian and uh, where everybody gets sacrificed equally. And so it is, it is yeah, in practice, there's always, um, you know, some Machiavellian power dynamic, some, um, you know, some way in which it's deeply fake, where, you know, the, the Ells, you know, it's, you know, it's, I'm not sure whether, not, I don't remember exactly what Ellsworth Tui thought of himself. I, th I think they're all characterized as weirdly, I, the way I remember it is he's characterized as sort of both very Machiavellian and manipulative, but on some level, ultimately not very self-aware. Well, and, actually, Ayn Rand said that she made him artificially self-aware hmm. in the book. Hmm. So he says explicitly, like he's um, hopefully it doesn't ruin it for people, but like you know, he's giving the character Peter Keating, true. like he's he's giving him this very powerful yeah, speech. He says, he says all these things, but does it, is he really even aware of that? But the idea is like the Paul Krugman isn't as yeah, aware. But the the, the the real world Ellsworth Tui is not going to be that self-aware. Right. No, no, definitely. Then, I have a question about. I'm curious. This, I mean, this could be a criticism of me and other people. Like, do you have any kind of allergy or at least suspicion of people who talk about 
changing the world. Because often when people talk about changing the world, there's kind of like, do you, what's motivating you? Do you, because when somebody says, hey, look, I love playing the piano. Like, I want to be happy. Like, to me, that's okay. I'm totally on board with that. Like, I get that. I can relate to that. If they say like, hey, I want to, I want to change the world. I wonder, it could, I mean, what I try to be is like, hey, I love thinking about these issues. I like, I like coming up with the truth and coming up with good ways to explain it. And I would like to be effective at it. And that would be satisfying. I try to be healthy there, but I see, I have an aversion sometimes other people, and I, I try to be aware of this in myself, where they say like, you know, I want to change education or something like that. But it's like, what do you care about? Because often it's the sort of desire to manipulate sure. others or to be superior to them. Yeah, to I, be the change I, well, agent. I have a lot of uh, allergic reactions to the verb change, but I, I think it is, um, let, me, let me start with a sociological observation. I, I, think, um, I think actually most people at this point have an allergic reaction to change. And the, the, the riff I always have is the 2008 Obama campaign mm -hmm. started with a slogan, hope and change. And then that poll tested badly. And so they had to change the slogan involving the word change from hope and change to the change we need, which if you think about it, means 180 degrees the opposite of the first. The first was as much change as possible. The second is the absolute minimum amount of change that's absolutely necessary because in 2008, as much as in 2023, when people hear the word change, they actually think it's a not neutral change or change for the better, but most likely change for the worse. Mm -hmm. Change is a neutral verb. Um, and so... Um, and so the substitution of change for progress is probably some version of decline. And that's, you know, the, the progressives use the word verb change and they've stopped using the verb progress um, because uh, progress actually you could measure, you could quantify it, you could, um, you could try to, to, um, to evaluate it in different ways, mm -hmm. whereas uh, change has this... Uh, protean character, but I think uh, that's that's my reaction. I think that's actually, uh, and I, I think, you know, I don't think the average person is not that dumb and figured that out as much as I have. But what, what about when people, because this must come up in your work a lot, you know, because you fund different things and people are like, I want to change the world. Uh, sure. I, th I think uh, I think at this point it's hackneyed. It doesn't work anymore. It, so it sounds like, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be more specific. You have to, it's, it's you know, um, Elon would never say that he's changing the world. He's going to Mars. So that's interesting. So that's an effectiveness thing. It's an effectiveness thing, but it also, I think, tells you something about, you know, um, it doesn't work anymore. And I think there are good reasons. There are good reasons it's not effective. And it's just, if you, if you, just, if you just think about it literally on the level of, of the verb, change is neutral. It doesn't, right. it does not tell us anything about the desirability. I think, I think progress you know, maybe that's debatable, but it at least sounds like it's, it's uh, you know, if we agreed on the basic parameters, we could evaluate and then we could agree on, um, you know, on, on progressing or developing or growing in a certain direction. But uh, somehow isn't, isn't change a decline from progress, grow, develop, you know, increase? Yeah, but, uh, but it's also you know, interesting all, all that the it's other verbs that uh, I think people used to use 40 or 50 years ago in a healthier United States. Yeah, I do think it's interesting that when somebody says change the world, it's it's notable that it's not even an improvement. And so that really seems to reveal it's really about their power or status in relation to others and not about actual, any value creation. Or at least it doesn't need to, but it can Yeah, it, it works on all these different it. levels. And maybe it's just maybe it's just it's maybe it's something that sounds impactful but not too threatening. But uh, surely uh, it it would be better to say improve the world, and then, but then that's also surely a harder standard. And it's one, you know, then what's your plan to improve the world, and then uh, we're going to evaluate that more critically than your plan to change the world. Can you talk briefly about this idea? We've discussed it a couple times privately about the the need for a positive vision for, and let's focus in particular on on my issue on energy and industry, because I want to I want to hear you talk about that and see if we differ at all and. See if I can learn anything. It's some there's some question how concrete you, you want to do this, but it is, you know, if if we're going to have a 21st century that is successful, I think it will somehow look different in a physical, material way from the from the 20th century. And then um, and then the you know the energy version would be 
that it it um, it it would physically look different. And my you know my intuition is that we have I don't know maybe we have um, lots of forests and uh, a few nuclear power plants and then that power the whole um, the whole country uh, versus we've chopped down all the trees and covered them with solar panels that barely work <laughs> or something like this. But there's sort of a concrete or, you know, we have windmills polluting the entire coast, just uglifying the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there's sort of like a picture of, um, of, what our, of what our society, what the future looks like. And we're hesitant to push too specific a picture because we're not in favor of centralized government we don't want to dictate this or something like that. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, I think this is, uh, this is one of the weaknesses on our side is that we, we don't actually have, and we'll know it when we see it, but we, we don't have a, of a, a concrete picture of how this different world will look like. And then the other side surely does. What, what, what do you think about the flying car as a historical visual? I think it's, Good, although it's 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 something I use more polemically. Yeah, and so it's more you know okay, it's more like an example of something we haven't quite done. It's 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 gone kind of haywire, um, but yeah, the Jetsons are you know that's a picture of of a future that's different. And so if we live, we're living in a Jetsons type world, we're surely in the future. Right, I mean I think that suffers from it. It's it's like doesn't there, have the holistic quality. Like it doesn't have the the nature. The well, enjoyment but, of the outdoors. There, there, yeah, there are all these questions. What you know, but what what do we think? You know, if if Los Angeles, if if, if this looks exactly like the present in twenty one hundred, I think we will have somehow failed in a very yeah. deep way. And then, um, and then the the green people would tell us if it looks exactly like this, that's the best we can hope for, and that's. Well, no, I think the best that's, we can hope for is if it just all oh, overgrew this. Well, they, they, yeah, but <laughs> something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just one quick thing on this to you. How much of it is a visual that, that becomes shared? How much of it is like a set of words, like some efficient set of words that captures things? How much of it is a, like a specific example that embodies something more broadly? Well, I, I, keep, I keep coming back to it is it shouldn't be abstracted. It's not just the rhetoric. It's not just the abstract rights. It's, and if we could actually have a picture, this is good. You know, one of the things that's been a little bit weak about the information age revolution in Silicon Valley is it's, it is, it's a little bit too abstracted from, from the physical layer. And so yes, um, AI and the large language models, it's, it's a very big technological breakthrough. It will make a, a very big difference, um, and then um, I, I don't think that's the only dimension in which the future should look different from the present. It can't just be the level of bits; it has to also be on the level of atoms. The one final thing I want to run by you. So this is we've talked about this a little bit offline, but I want to run by you sort of my approach to improving this stuff, and then I imagine you'll have some criticisms of it. Um, so I've been very focused in the past, in the, the past three years and for the foreseeable future, I'm really interested in what's the maximum political change that's possible. And, and my mm. working theory has been that there are a lot of politicians who would be much better than they are if they had sort of perfect access to messaging and policy mm. ideas. I looked and I'll take the energy landscape. I looked at the energy landscape and basically, like there was an enormous delta between what I believed was possible messaging wise mm -hmm. and policy wise that say pro energy politicians had, like even in terms of how to how to refute climate catastrophe arguments, how to know what actual reform of different things would be, what to do about nuclear. This, and I, my theory was, well, if if I could build out all the messaging and policy in the most persuasive possible way, they would be receptive to it because they're not. They're not rejecting the good stuff. They just have limited access. They only have their staffers. You know, they have random lobbyists. They have white mm -hmm. papers from think tanks. They don't have that good resources. And what I found with this project, Energy Talking Points, is it seems to be working well in that more people are using the message. Presidential campaigns are interested in it. Um, so my, I, I'm just going to try to push it as far as I can. Like, I'm going to try to build out mm -hmm. a full energy freedom policy, arguments for everything, like the best argument for everything. Like, 
What do you think of this approach? And what do you think are the limitations of how effective it can be? You know, I am incredibly sympathetic to it. It's, it's certainly the way I'm personally biased to think that there is an argument, there is, if we just find the right language, the right words, the right argument, um, that this is, you know, this is, um, this is the way we really move things forward. And I'm personally very, very biased to think in things that way. And then, you know, I think, you know, on the other side, I always think that uh, the omnipotence of speech was, um, that was what the sophists believed. In, and uh, that was also in some sense what the sophists have in common with the biblical God. It's just in the beginning is the word. And then if you just figure out the right words, um, everything will follow. And um, I, I somehow think it can't just be, and we're not just in a Oxford Union debating society. If, 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 this, if this was sufficient, the Oxford Union would run the world. So what else, what do you think is, I mean, so let's include like images, graphs, examples, stories, like this is all part of creating the full ammunition package. I think, I think there's a part of it that's just not even an argument. It just, you have to actually do it and it has to work. And, and so there's, yeah, there's one layer which you're doing, which I am all in favor of where it's you're convincing people and giving the language and then on some level, people have to just frack for the oil and, and lower the price and make our world better. And uh, it, it, it has to- it And then that influences of, policy? That influences it. Yeah. That, if, so if, is that like an Uber it, type example of where you just prove yeah, it yeah. in if practice? Uber, if, Uber, if Uber relied on convincing the taxi drivers to give up right. by talking about it, man, that that's, that wasn't the easiest way to do it. <laughs> well, I don't know what the taxi drivers did. I know, I know, but you okay, know what I mean. Okay, but let's, let's, bra let's brainstorm control. about this. Okay, so this is interesting. So what, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, but like, what can we do to, to facilitate test cases then? It's just, it's just to some extent, you know, to some extent, you don't always ask, you know, you don't always ask for permission. You, you, you know, you should try to get things done and, and ask for forgiveness and you should, you know, and then, and then you know we're, you know we're probably, to the extent that it's political, yes, you have to, you have to convince people before you're allowed to do anything, and uh, and at the margins, you know, you just, um, you just uh, do the right thing, and then um, and then explain it later, and that's uh, it's, that's still a much healthier approach. What about mind. what do you what are the best like for nuclear? What do you think are the most I, promising? I, I don't think you can do this in all the. There's some areas where you know. No, the no, no. I'm in favor of it in nuclear. I'm just wondering work. places. Where you could, where sure, you could sure, do surely, things, like um, around the world. Sure, surely, yeah, it, it's like I have this intuition on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, that um, you know they have an iron grip on the U.S. But aren't there some other countries where you, where you could you know where you could roll out a you know some new medical treatment, some new um, uh, some new micro reactor, and uh, and then that's the way you do an end run around. Um, the um, the um, iron grip, the sort of um, um, intellectual, sophistic state has in our society. I'm very interested in this angle. I feel like there needs to be more it's, it's, thinking it's, I've, about I've, it. I've thought about it some. It's it's hard to do in practice. It was the seasteading. It's the you, know, you start yeah. a new country in the Caribbean. It's medical tourism. Well, you're you know, the, you're the, the guy positioned. There are all it. these versions I've thought about, and it's again. But, but have again, you tested but it look, a lot? Look, we're now, we're now, we're now, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to, go I'm going to be self-aware enough <laughs> to acknowledge that I'm now guilty of exactly what I'm accusing you of, where, um, you know, yeah, you want to do seasteading, you want to do medical tourism, but uh, talking about seasteading, talking about medical tourism, um, we did too much of that the last 15 years and not enough of just doing it. Not enough of doing it? Just doing it. Okay, well, I, I'm hoping, I have no inside information, I hope you're doing something amazing behind the scenes that will just, that, that you'll later get forgiveness for because it's so amazing. But that Uber thing is powerful. So as we wrap up, uh, any, any final thoughts you wanna share? I'm all good. Share? You're yeah. good? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for doing this. Uh, it ended up being really fun and I think awesome. the people will appreciate it. One final note is uh, thanks so much to my friend Rian Doris at consulting.com. They've put together a great team to record this. 
And uh, I'm a big fan of their work. Check out consulting.com. Big fan of Sam Ovens, the founder of that. Helped me a lot in my life and business. And uh, thanks. Thanks to Peter. Great awesome. to see you as always. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Alex. My pleasure.